Hello, my name is Danae Doris, ACEF Project Manager, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Inclusive Design at Universities, Common Errors and Best Practices. The American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities is pleased to host today's webinar. For those of you attending for your first ACEF webinar, ACEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ACEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. If it is not your first time to join an ACEF webinar, welcome back. Please know that ACEF is here to support you beyond today's webinar, and we invite you to follow ACEF online at acefacilities.org or join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, or Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Dr. Edward Steinfeld, joining us today for this webinar entitled Inclusive Design at Universities. Dr. Steinfeld currently serves as a professor of architecture at the University of Buffalo. In addition, he is the director of the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access, IDEA, which he founded, and the principal investigator for the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Universal Design at Buffalo. With a research focus on universal design, human factors, and social theory in design, Dr. Steinfeld has written over 100 publications, received numerous awards for excellence, and continues to serve as an expert consultant on accessibility issues nationally and internationally. Welcome, Dr. Steinfeld, and thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience today. I'm happy to be here, and um, it's a pleasure uh, to do this program today, and I hope everybody uh, enjoys it and learns something. Um, I'd like to start by asking you to uh, indicate your role or position in the spectrum of uh, university facilities. Okay, thank you very much. So it seems like what we have is um, teachers, district or campus administrators, some architects, uh, and mostly other. 40% uh, of you are other. The outline for the presentation today is um, shown on the screen. Uh, what are the reasons for loss that lawsuits are brought against universities? Perhaps we have some lawyers online. Uh, approaches to accessibility audits of college campuses and their limitations. Uh, common findings that we find from accessibility audits with some examples. And the role of universal or inclusive design and how it can improve compliance with ADA requirements. What are the reasons for uh, lawsuits? Um, I would say that the, that the issue that sparks lawsuits the most is one or more individuals have needs that are not met in a timely manner. And if this gets aggravating to the individuals, then they start to seek legal action. On the college side, on the university side, there's often a lack of understanding of responsibilities under program accessibility guidelines. Universities often think that they have met requirements, but they, they actually haven't. Another uh, reason is that there's, the university might have only given nominal attention to the law and not really uh, devoted a serious uh, attention that would solve problems as they come up but rather they've done a cursory job of complying with the accessibility law. Another is that there has been poor implementation of assessments or audits and the improvements uh, so that things are just not done well and therefore often universities think they have done what they should but they haven't really done it well enough to to solve the problems that individuals have. And lack of follow-through after initial improvements is another big issue. And this has to do with the ignoring the needs of individuals. The photograph you see on the left is an accessible entrance to an architecture school on a university campus, and it's the service entrance. So there's an accessible entrance, but it requires individuals who need to use the accessible entrance to 
go around the entire building from the main part of the campus and it and it can lead to problems in terms of program accessibility uh, and obviously it's not really a good solution another reason is the lack of quality control on consultants work architects who are hired to do work consultants who are hired to do an assessment of the campus those kinds of consultants and then we notice a lot that maintenance and operations activities often subvert accessibility provisions we'll get into that later I'll show you some examples of that this has mostly to do with the with the garbage equipment garbage and uh, access to receptacles and other things like uh, paper towel dispensers that are put up by maintenance and operations act staff and and are not under the control of the uh, the people who are in charge of accessibility and then finally to sum everything up if a university has a culture of accessibility and this is part of the philosophy of the university to to provide accessibility not just to people with disabilities but in general to all students and staff then things seem to be better uh, things get done in a more timely way and priorities are dealt with as they should so that's our summing up if we look at well how to avoid a lawsuit develop an accessibility culture and we'll talk about what that means uh, as we go on it's important to start a program like this with um, reflecting on why we have accessibility uh, as you probably all know the anti-discrimination laws related to disability acknowledge that all qualified individuals have a right to higher education and there are three federal pieces of federal legislation that require this the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968 that applies to all federally financed construction the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II, uh, for public universities. And higher education, but the real issue is that higher education improves employment opportunities. And this data from, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics demonstrates that very graphically, that uh, people with a bachelor's degree have a much higher rate of employment. They have much lower rate of um, unemployment as another way of putting it although people with disabilities tend to have higher rates of unemployment than those without you can see that the difference between having just some college or an associate degree and having a bachelor's degree or higher is really significant and but in order to attain that degree uh, one has to really have an environment that is supportive and allows people to continue to not just enter the university but also stay in the university. So what are the standards that we use should we should use for design? There are a number of different standards that can be used including the state building codes, the regulations that a state education department might provide for a uh, public uh, university system. Section 504 had what referenced um, the UFAS standards that some of you may be familiar with but today we we recommend using the two, 2010 ADA standards for accessible design which are the latest standards that apply to new construction and any renovation or additions so if you're doing an assessment or if you're doing new construction that's the one that should be used it's important to note that when universities first were required to create accessible campuses there was often no design review at any government level so even though changes have been made it doesn't mean that they were done well and it doesn't mean that they will necessarily comply with the current law so this is the still a lot of problems sometimes in particularly in older buildings on campuses Now the next slide, I want to focus on uh, Section 504 and ADA Title II regulations. They have, uh, Section 504 is important for private universities because they apply to any uh, contractor of the federal government. So are getting grants or contracts from the federal government, even though you're a private university, that means you have to comply with Section 504. Title II, as I said before, applies to any construction with pub with public funding many states by the way also have additional requirements 
and I'm not going to get into that because it's uh, quite complex to try to cover all the state. But Section 504 and ADA Title II have some process requirements that often are forgotten. They require that someone be in charge uh, of accessibility on campus, and often that's the ADA coordinator. They also require a self-evaluation and a transition plan, and in our work, Whenever there's a lawsuit, we find that the first thing that lawyers do is ask for the self-evaluation and transition plan, and they ask us to review them, and often they're very, they're very limited and, and they're very old and they haven't been updated. They also require adoption of a standard, and so it's very clearly specifying what standard is being used to do an assessment and to do revisions is very important because that sort of sets the baseline for any uh, any evaluation of compliance and whether they've fulfilled the requirements of the law. Also, implementation of accessibility is required in the law as for specific dates. Uh, new construction completely accessible when it's and whenever the law went into effect, and old construction required program accessibility. And so this this when things were done be, can can become a an issue in a lawsuit. And it's very important to understand those, those rules. Finally, it's not enough to just make improvements, but also to maintain the accessibility that's achieved. And here's where we get into the problem of changes made after the fact, or um, maybe situations change, uses change, and, and accessibility has not been maintained. For example, changes in security might limit access to a building to different entrances, and that might eliminate what accessible accessibility was provided. This slide I showed before with the service entrance is a good example. And then finally, accommodations for individuals should be made as they are, as they are needed, um, as required by the law. What are some of the issues with process? First of all, there's often a poor understanding of the requirements, what the responsibilities of management are, what the transition plan requirements are, what program accessibility means. A belief that's a one-time activity often is a lack of end-user participation, meaning people with disabilities on campus, and there's often a lack of long-term follow-through. A report is written and changes are made on campus, the books are closed, but nobody pays attention to it down the road. Uh, on the left, you see a, a slide with a, a toilet and some grab bars. And this is an example of some of the things we find that the implementation is really poor. And in, in, in this case, none of these grab bars actually meet the requirements of the law. Even though we have a lot of grab bars here, they really aren't meeting the requirements of the law. They may be good for an individual, but they should also be uh, acceptable in terms of the uh, requirement. Well, let's talk a little bit now about accessibility audits. There are a number of different types of the different ways to do accessibility audits. One that's used frequently is called the walkthrough. This is often done by someone who's knowledgeable or thinks they're knowledgeable and sometimes it's uh, a group is brought in, often an advocacy group that's relatively inexpensive and can give the university some ideas about what should be done. Uh, it's inexpensive and fast, in other words. Uh, it can be good for individual issues, and it can identify major problems that are very obvious. But to be effective, this kind of approach requires a deep expertise. And we've seen this used in some very uh, complex situations, and often uh, an architect on staff or a consumer advocate uh, go around and look at problems together and they often really don't document what they're doing. They don't have a, an explicit standard they're using for evaluation. And down the road, they run into problems, particularly when there's no documentation. And the walkthrough is best used as a follow-up after compliance has been achieved. In other words, it's best used once program accessibility is achieved uh, in a well-documented and rigorous way just to make sure there are no issues outstanding or to see what new issues might be identified over time. Another approach is the use of a yes-no checklist. This, this is a checklist that has the requirements of the ADA listed with a box to check off. Does it meet it? Does it not meet it? 
these checklists are used in a systematic way to go through buildings. There are checklists available uh, online for free from the U.S. Access Board. Most important to remember here is it identifies barriers but not solutions. It's relatively inexpensive and it's easy to develop a report and documentation, particularly if it can be computerized. However, it's difficult for use in making changes and follow through, mainly because the conditions of the existing buildings are not noted in these checklists. So uh, I'm going to switch to the next slide. So before I do, what you see is a slide here on the left of a ramp without handrails. It looks okay, but in fact, if it exceeds the uh, 1 in 20 slope, it should have handrails on both sides. So the checklist by itself does not provide enough information to implement change. Another approach we like to call is the project, we like to call the project management approach. And this is the one that we, we recommend. It's a systematic procedure. It can use a yes new checklist, but in addition, it collects additional data on actual conditions. So for example, if it's studying an area where there's a, uh, a door that's too narrow, it actually, you would actually note how what the clear width of the door is so that you know what needs to be done to make the changes. Uh, you would also maybe take a photograph or note the type of construction. Now this kind of approach is designed for long-term use and provides information for future projects uh, and particularly implementation and large renovation projects. So if, for example, the, there may be a baseline program access to a building but an audit might show that some improvements in the building could be made, but it might be a while before a project is scheduled for that building. Then you have a database with the information at it when an architect or is hired to make to do the renovation plan. Not only are they going to be looking at accessibility, they might be looking at sustainable design and uh, some programmatic changes. In this way, they have the information at their fingertips. They probably will double check it. At least they know what to look for. And it, simplifies planning projects and implementing implementing improvements. We recommend doing this in a computerized database so it can be searched and it can be used in project management activities in the space and facilities office, planning projects and budgeting. This is the best kind of system also for follow-up because the database can be used to indicate what projects have been completed. Sometimes universities don't really know that. They don't have a good documentation on it and in terms of their transition plan. They have a transition plan, make changes, but they don't know what on the transition plan has actually been completed. So who should do this kind of thing? Um, we think a consultant with experience should do it. It also requires some software support. So that means uh, getting somebody who, who can implement a computer system, uh, a database management system and who knows how to do it, a user-friendly database management system that facilities planning people can use. And it should have an in-house team participating as well as a, as a consulting group. Now, who should be involved in-house? Uh, we recommend that the ADA coordinator for the campus be involved, staff and students with disabilities, space and facilities planning personnel, support services like parking and transportation, um, information technology folks, physical plant personnel, IT support uh, provided so that the computer system is usable in the long term uh, and compatible with existing campus systems, and a campus architect or consulting architect. You're, here you see a picture of a, of a campus building in an older campus, a historic campus, where a ramp was added on the outside of the building. Uh, I use this to illustrate the need for involving a campus architect. This is not just a, a matter uh, of technically providing accessibility, but in a building like this, you don't want to have a ramp like this, a very utilitarian ramp on the front of a, of a building that has historic value. So you need to start thinking about the aesthetics of the, of the solutions, and that's where it's important to get a campus architect or a consulting architect who's not just concerned necessarily about accessibility. They might do both. They might do the accessibility part, but also the, the, the design quality part. Or you might have someone do the accessibility part of it and then have an architect who's going to be concerned about the quality of the design uh, involved as well. So what is the scope of an accessibility audit? An audit should include setting priorities. 
in the early days of accessibility, those priorities might have been different than they are today. You might have achieved all the priorities. Now it's time to look at some other things, like what improvements have been made that have deteriorated and might be updated. Uh, how do we improve the architectural quality to improve the, the campus quality? How do we address security issues that weren't present in the past? How are sustainability issues going to be addressed? as well as accessibility. What are the intersections of accessibility with other design issues? The accessibility audit should be, the goal should be, one of the goals should be identify non-compliant buildings and site elements, plan barrier mover projects and budget them so one can request the proper funding, develop prototypical construction details. It can include training people to use a survey so campus staff can do this in the future if you hire a consultant, for example. Uh, it might include training on the use of data in project planning uh, and the use of data in operations. Physical plan have access to this database that I mentioned. And then uh, we recommend a test and evaluation cycle. We recommend doing an initial audit of a few buildings, testing out the database, evaluating it, uh, and then following through. Uh, too often consultants are hired to do something but in fact the data they provide is not going to be that useful on a campus. We have uh, worked on campuses where they've spent over hundred thousand dollars doing an accessibility audit that they never completed and found to be useless before they finished it. We have been hired to do audits that are at you know a fraction of costs like that in the same campus. So you need good people, you need to test it out, make sure it's going to work before you commit to the full product. And now we're going to get into some common findings of audits. I'm going to start with transportation. It's important to think about the campus and its relationship to the context. How do you get to the campus? By public transportation, by campus transit, from one place to another, from one campus to another. Our university has three different campuses. How do you get from one to the other? It's not just about what's on the campus, but moving in and on and off the campus uh, with public transportation, with transportation options. Many people with disabilities do not drive. They need to have accessible public transportation access. And some of the things we find is that the public transit authority does not have accessible stops or paths to the stop. Some suburban campuses and rural campuses don't even have sidewalks to the pu public transit and stops. Uh, accessible campus transit can often not serve critical locations. Campus transit might rely, over rely on special transport. For many years on our campus we had a contract with a uh, bus service, a uh, private bus company that provide service between our campuses. Their buses were not accessible. So accessible transportation was provided by small vans. That proved to be very costly for our campus and very inadequate in terms of uh, people, the uh, students with disabilities. And, and um, because of long wait times and often the, the uh, just poor service. So recently our campus uh, uh, started a new contract with the same led to them purchasing uh, fully accessible buses. So now there's less reliance, much less reliance on special transportation. Inaccessible stops on campus is another issue we find. Moving to the to the next slide, one of the biggest problems is not enough accessible parking in the right locations for students and staff. Students and staff move around on a campus, so it's not it's not acceptable in many cases unless there is really good transportation. Uh, for them to, to actually get to their classes on time and to have a proper schedule and the same for staff for them to get to their from their office to their classes or from what meetings and other things on time it's often not possible to use uh, public to use the public systems of transportation and to have a designated stop one designated spot for one person doesn't allow them really full access to the to access to the campus. So in our campus, for example, a student might come to one campus in the morning and be at another campus in the afternoon, or they might come one day to one campus or another day to another campus just to give them a designated spot on one campus that they then have to leave their car in may not work for them. What this means is more accessible parking than there are actually people that have permits. So uh, this is a big issue. 
over time, campuses can learn how much campus parking they really need, how much accessible campus parking they really need, and they should make accommodations for that. Uh, often, there's not enough accessible parking for visitors, and it becomes very difficult for visitors to get on campus, get a permit, a temporary permit, improperly marked spaces, particularly striping and signs. We see signs, for example, between two parking spaces with arrows going in either direction, left and right, saying, you know, accessible spaces. That sign is often put in the access aisle, and then what we see is people parking in the access aisle because the sign does not say specifically that you can't park in the access aisle. <laughs> they're not designated properly, or, and often they're not designed properly. They're not wide enough. Access aisles don't have curb ramps. Um, another issue with parking is parking permit procedures. Uh, on one project we did, uh, students reported that they could not they, they had access to the parking permit office. There was never enough parking there, accessible parking, so they couldn't actually get there to get their parking permit, which would, which the campus required that they do in person. Lack of curb ramps at accessible parking is is another common problem. Uh, and finally, lack of accessible transportation from remote lots. Ideally, accessible parking should not be in remote lots, but sometimes it might be necessary depending on how much campus parking is available. What you see here in the, I'm going back to the slide, what you see in this picture is a, is a campus parking lot that is in a residence hall, but uh, it's right in the middle of campus, and it would be a good location to have accessible parking, uh, but it only has accessible parking for the resident. The pedestrian network is a big issue on campus accessibility. Lack of pathways to the campus I already mentioned. Another problem is inaccessible or poorly maintained public rights-of-way. The streets rights-of-way leading to an urban campus can be difficult to manage. Uh, sometimes you have lack of good accessibility between the public rights of way and the interiors of campus. Uh, one university had, uh, that I visited had a, a quadrangle, a historic quadrangle, with a flight of stairs from the public street up to the quadrangle. Now there was one accessible entry somewhere, but it me meant going all around the campus trying to find it, and that's not really an acceptable approach. So the connection between the public right-of-way and the campus is very important. Lack of continuity in pedestrian networks is one of the most significant problems, um, often requiring students to drive around, get close to the buildings that they need to get to, uh, or take a very long time, sometimes 40 minutes to half an hour, to get around uh, from one place to another. The So, so there might be uh, in the in the language of the law, a literal interpretation of the law that there's one accessible route from every from from one building to another, but in actuality, it might not be feasible to to um, move from one class to another. Therefore, program accessibility issues or not goals are not really being met. Sometimes uh, key paths are too steep, and this might include street crossings that are outside the control of the university. And this is an important, so what I'm saying here is that it's very important for universities to coordinate with the, with the local municipalities to provide good access to their campuses and to make sure that they uh, deliver uh, program accessibility. Often we see missed opportunities, very easy projects to, con to provide connections to context, and uh, interior routes often neglected. Uh, so, for example, in our climate, we have uh, really difficult conditions during the middle of winter. Uh, so we have a lot of um, bridges and underground connections. One campus we studied had a major underground connection route, but the university uh, did not agree that the underground route should be made accessible. So they focused on the above ground route. That meant that all students with disabilities had to go outdoors in, t in, the, in, the, in the middle of winter with deep snow conditions, heavy winds, very cold temperatures, where all the students without disabilities could walk around without their coats on and get from place to place. But the underground connections had stairs, and the university did not see that as a need, um, even though 
because they felt that they were meeting their requirements under under the ADA and t uh, under Section 504 and the ADA by um, providing the above ground connections. Here's an example from a, another historic campus where there are two quadrangles, one higher and one lower, and the, the two are not well connected uh, by um, a uh, pedestrian pathway. In the site design arena, uh, we see landscape creating obstructions, encroaching plantings, overhanging trees, debris on pathways from the tree, from trees and other landscaping, poorly plowed ramps and uh, curb ramps and walkways, amenities that are not accessible, um, paving materials that are difficult to use, excessive slopes or cross slopes, curb ramps that are not compliant, signs that do not identify accessible pathways, construction projects that create barriers. Uh, and this last point, the ADA requires maintenance of accessibility. So if a construction project is initiated, there has to be an accessible path around it. On the left, you see a photograph of a ramp that was built close to a building leading to the landing of the stairs at the entry. And that, uh, you can see that there are trees planted in the landscape right next to the ramp. Now those trees, actually, I don't believe it's a ramp. I think it's not a steep enough slope to be considered a ramp, so it didn't require uh, railings. But when those tree limbs grow up, it, it got in the way and it reduced the headroom on created a danger, particularly for people with visual impairment. Moving on to building design. One of the most significant problems we see, the most frequent problem we see, is door opening forces too high and uh, at entry doors. We also find autom automated doors that do not work, uh, door maneuvering clearances that are not adequate, lifts that aren't operational or that require people to go and hunt down keys and get assistance. Emergency egress is not accessible and are there no area, area of rescue assistance. Uh, we see alarm systems not equipped with visual alarms and accessible entries that are service entries as you saw in the picture before. Railings on stairs and ramps that don't meet standards and ramps that are too steep or landings that are too small. Here's an interesting picture on the left. It's, it shows a, um, a ramp leading to a building entry uh, and there was not really a good way to build a landing and they found this clever way they cantilevered the landing of the ramp out around the entry portico. Um, this is actually in another country uh, in Norway and note that the ramp railings from our perspective are not accessible because a wheelchair could slip under the railing so we require curbs or uh, barriers um, in the openings there. Uh, so that's not a good example from from the perspective of American practice, but it's an it's a clever way of creating a, a landing at the top end. So scheduling class scheduling people really can't move a class into an accessible location off because there are too many the too many demands for accessible classrooms. The solution to that, well, I'll get into that down the road. Um, Laboratories in our facilities often don't have accessible equipment. And one might say in this respect, well, if, if a, an art student needs accessible equipment or, or a science student needs it, we can provide it. But the problem there is that it takes too long to do that unless there is a plan in place and that equipment is available. Recreation facilities we find that have limited accessibility, uh, poor path of travel, uh, inaccessible path of travel to certain facilities. Uh, pools in particular are often not accessible. Sometimes there are weight rooms or fitness uh, facilities that the campus, um, the people that run the facilities feel that, well, no one with a disability is going to get, get going to use these facilities so they locate them in inaccessible locations. Uh, but that isn't the case. That's a misconception that people with disability will not want to use fitness facilities. And then protruding objects are a big problem. And one of the biggest well, protruding object issues is the underside of freestanding stairways. An example you see on the left in a university, most of the see these little railings and other kind of obstacles that are put under the stairway. That is usually an afterthought. The architect has designed a monumental stairway and then they realize later that it's not 
meeting accessibility requirements, so they, they stick these things in to solve the problem. Further list, uh, bathrooms that are not properly designed for accessibility, signs that don't meet standards, no access to stages in theaters or auditoriums, limited accessible seating in stadiums, vendors that don't implement accessibility. For example, uh, on our campus there is a cafe outsourced to a, a chain and they have really not given any thought to accessibility in that cafe. Uh, historic buildings that do not have sufficient accessibility. Uh, well, on the left you see a historic uh, chapel on a campus and there is a ramp leading to the chapel, the main entrance to the chapel, although one could question whether that's a, an appropriate solution because of the, the appearance of it in this historic setting. But then when you go into the, the building, you often, you often find accessibility to historic buildings into the building, but then inside the building there is very limited accessibility. Let's look at some of the facilities management issues. One is limited adaptive computer workstations, uh, soap and paper dispensers that are not accessible. These are often put up by physical plant staff without any training or understanding of what the accessibility requirements are. Blocked access to copy machines and other equipment. Um, elevator, like, you know, there might be a change machine that, or a swipe card machine that is not that has been added by a vendor that is not uh, accessible. Elevator and door repairs not done in a timely manner. Door closers not adjust and timely in the case of uh, a student with a disability or a staff member with a disability means within an hour or two, you know, um, uh, that this should be, these kinds of things should be dealt with almost immediately. Door closers that are not adjusted within the required range, uh, range of uh, force. Scheduling of accessible in classroom and lecture halls, not timely, which I've mentioned the problem before. Assistive listening systems that are not available or not used because professors uh, don't know about them, don't refuse to use them, haven't been trained. Uh, signage that's not updated. No emergency evacuation plan. This is becoming a bigger issue in the world of accessibility. And garbage receptacles that block access to bathrooms. So here we have a on the sl on the slide a restroom with an accessible toilet stall, but the door cannot be opened because the garbage recept uh, fully because the garbage receptacle is in the way. When this was identified, the management uh, told us they'd solved the problem. We came back to see uh, the garbage receptacle was located inside the toilet stall. <laughs> so you need to educate your physical staff, physical plant staff, about things like this. Some of the policy issues. This is something that is often ignored. Um, campuses should have co good coordination between departments. There are a lot of different departments that are involved in providing accessibility and maintaining it. As you saw in the previous slide, physical plant has to be not involved. They, uh, things can happen after the fact. Student support services may be inadequate to make sure that uh, students are getting this, the ex level of accessibility they need. There are often misguided policies, like one example is concentrating accessible housing all in one door, which restricts social interaction opportunities for students and can be uh, viewed, we view it as a uh, limitation on program accessibility in terms of the residential life program. Uh, reliance on paratransit rather than instituting an accessible transit system. Policies based on myths. For example, this building is the this building is an is a building that has no accessibility to the top floor, and that's where the band practices the only band on campus. So if you're you know the I guess the assumption was that uh, if you have a band or an or you know a campus orchestra, you you won't get any students who can't who can't walk on can't walk stairs. That might not be the case. Difficulty getting parking permits, an example I already mentioned, and inadequate web-based information on accessibility. Often web-based information is uh, out of date, not maintained properly, and is not adequate uh, to get to where you go. So in terms of best practices, we recommend promoting a culture of accessibility for all. That is the takeaway from this. Uh, presentation. This means a top-down commitment all the way from the trustees and the president down through the organization. It means sharing authority. 
the policymakers, the facility planning staff, the physical plant, consultants brought on board, support staff, and faculty. Oh, the next, uh, that slide on the left is a, is a building uh, learner hall in Columbia University. An interesting project because the Columbia University's main quadrangle is, is off of a main avenue and the stairs to that avenue were pretty extensive. So when they built this building, which connected from, from the avenue to the interior of the quadrangle, ramp, they used the ramp system in the building to make that connection from the avenue. So he's from the avenue, you could go into the building through an accessible entrance and use the ramp inside the building to get to the quadrangle level. An interesting uh, way to take advantage of an opportunity to make connections. So training and accountability are very important uh, in terms of uh, maintaining accessibility. As our continual assessment of needs we recommend thinking creatively rather than within a rule-based mode and viewing accessibility as, in this case, uh, an opportunity, not a constraint, and then evaluating results. Don't just implement them, but evaluate them over time uh, periodically to make sure things are still working. This is the interior of Werner, Lerner Hall. A is uh, with glass. This is a glass, uh, exciting, but it's a glass surface, and even though it's it's designed to be slip resistance. When water gets on it, it's evidently not, because when I went to visit, parts of the ramp were covered with uh, carpet, indicating that in the wet weather, it wasn't working as planned. This is um, our own campus. Uh, we are located on an older campus at the State University of New York, and it's gone through um, about five years of infrastructure improvements. So initially, and we're still underway. We also have a new master plan and a lot of further improvements were made down the road. But, you know, initially the campus had very limited accessibility, wooden ramps at all the buildings, rather crude curb ramps. And in the infrastructure improvements, the campus uh, pedestrian system has been, there are many extensive improvements, including water mains, sewage, heating systems, and so on. And the, the past, the Paths have been ripped up and rebuilt many times over the last five years. So I'm going to show some of the things that have been done. One of the things that, that was installed about 10 years ago was this campus directory system. And you can see on the right, there's the, there are these pylons with these maps of the campus. And on the right is a close-up showing accessible parking and accessible entries. Uh, and this is very important for finding your way around a campus where not all the entries to buildings are accessible. Uh, and that's the case because of all the older buildings. So this is a really critical and important need. But further follow-up showed that people couldn't find some of the accessible entries who are coming by car. Uh, they couldn't find the accessible parking that was closest to the entries they needed. So new signs have been cropping up. Uh, another problem is that a lot of the accessible parking has been built, uh, but not necessarily cl close to the accessible entry. So here is an interesting example on the right. Uh, it, this is the the building you can see is this, is the actual the entrance is it's a medical school and there's a sports medicine clinic where a lot of people are going to be coming with broken bones and so forth. The accessible parking out front is very adequate. There's a lot of it. However. Uh, immediate entrance looks like this and there and so yet to be provided a ramp maybe that's in the cards but right now there's no accessible entrance on this side of the building you have to get pretty far away and there aren't there aren't as many accessible parking places in that location so this is why follow is need to make sure you're accommodating the real needs of the campus this is uh, what's happening with our you know, at one time, accessible parking would be installed without thought to where people were going from that parking. Now you can see there's a curb ramp to the uh, walkway that leads to um, uh, one of the main campus buildings, lecture hall buildings. They've created a, a crosswalk here leading to another curb ramp on the other side because that leads to the uh, student activities building, which is to the right. And... Um, so it's a nice con continuous path of travel uh, that incorporates both crosswalks and axiles. And this is an interesting example of a developing need. 
this is a, um, a landscape experiment, uh, an experiment with sustainable landscape planting. And the walkways are porous paving. However, the walkways are not plowed during winter. And during winter, they put up a barrier here that says, uh, you know, pass at your own risk. It explains it's an experiment. Uh, and uh, while it's a really nice improvement on the campus from a aesthetics and well as a uh, sustainability improvement, uh, it, it requires people with disabilities to go around the entire quadrangle. Uh, does it work for people with disabilities? Is that acceptable? You know, there needs to be follow-up on that. In this case, I think it does, but it's the kind of thing that can come up down the road after initial accessibility seems to be uh, achieved. This is why we need to do a continuous kind of oversight on what's going on. Uh, we also have, here's another part of that quadrangle, and you can see the entry going up to the building. Rather than a ramp, the ramp, the old wooden ramp that was located here was taken away with this landscape improvement project, and a graded walkway was added, which I think is a great solution, getting rid of the old, uh, the ramp that was really an eyesore, and uh, avoiding the uh, installation of another ramp. However, there's also been an, there, an attempt on our campus to add, uh, improve things for bicyclists. And when they put the bicycling, bicycles um, rack in, what, they're, what we're seeing is bicycles parked sticking out into the, into the uh, pathway, which although maybe not technically an ADA violation, for a visually impaired person, this is, is, this is really a hazard. Uh, but it also, if the if the walkway were smaller than it is, it would also result in it could also result in reducing the walkway clearance to an unacceptable. Uh, um. And here's another example of uh, making improvements on the campus. The uh, on the other side of the quadrangle is actually like really improved. This ramp here's a a ramp that was added years ago. It's a nice ramp. It works, uh, but a, a little bit. Uh, out of context, but by planting all this planting around it, it has uh, improved the appearance of the ramp. And here's an example of um, of a problem, a difficult problem that was solved in a reasonable way, I think. This is a building that has classrooms on one side and lecture halls on the other, and there's a split level plan. So you can't, uh, and there's an, there are stairs at, at this entry. So you can see the, the ramp on the right leading down to the lower floor of the, and here's another picture of it, down to the lower floor, the end, the door looks like an inside with a new door added providing access to the lecture hall wing. But the other wing is accessible by, by elevator from the lecture hall landing. But the location of the restrooms, the accessible restrooms, are not easy to identify. And so what we see here is a uh, signage which is, is needed to show uh, people where the accessible restrooms are. And then the restroom is interesting. Uh, you can see the special hardware that was made to provide accessible, provide ADA compliant grab bars. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit because we're running out of time with this last slide. Uh, an interesting facilities management issue. On the left is a classroom that I used to lecture in, uh, and all of the desks are wired and connected, so they cannot be moved around. Well, I had a class, I had a student who, had, who was deaf, and so that to participate in, in uh, discussions, it was really important for her to be, to, for us to alter the, plas the classroom, the, the seating configuration. Uh, but it was impossible because of these desks, because they were all wired so the laptops could be plugged in. Nowadays, laptops can, the batteries last longer. On the right is the newer system, actually less expensive, much more flexible. So I'm going to stop right now, and uh, I think we've uh, run out of time. Um, hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentation. You can email me if you have any questions that I might answer, I'm going to skip over here to give you my contact information. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Edward Steinfeld, and our participants for joining our webinar today. We hope that you took this opportunity to learn from the content presented 
engaged with the speaker, and will use this content to advance your professional knowledge on issues related to inclusive design in a university setting or other settings as well. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback. Remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please call if the ACEF staff can assist you in any way. Have a great day.